Welcome everybody to our December flash talk with the Kelsey Museum. Um, this month's talk is entitled Disco in the Kelsey Museum with Director of Education Kathy Person. She will be joined by Taylor Tyrell, a PhD student in Classics and Ancient History. DISCO stands for the Digital Study of Kelsey Objects, an educational outreach project at the Kelsey Museum. Kathy Person will present on the current state of the project, its goals, and its challenges. Um, as always, today's presentation will be 15 minutes, uh, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A with our audience. Um, so if you continue to uh, mute yourselves until the presentation is over, um, and then uh, we will give you the chance to uh, ask questions in the chat or to unmute yourselves and ask your questions. Um, so I will turn it over now to Kathy Person and Taylor Tyrell. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thank you so much, Stephanie, for that introduction. Welcome, everyone. Um, so we're going to give a brief presentation, and then I'm eager to hear what everyone has to say. <laughs> uh, and Taylor is joining me today um, to help uh, talk more about the, the nitty gritty details and the technical side of things, since that is what she is doing an awesome job at for us right now. So uh, let me just share my screen. Uh, there we go. All right, everybody see it all right? Great. So, um, yeah, there we go. All right, well, as Stephanie has said, so yes, we're DISCO. Um, so as Stephanie said, DISCO stands for the Digital Study of Kelsey Objects. And this is a two-year project that was, that's been funded by the University of Michigan Office of the Provost. It began in spring of 2019. Um, and uh, obviously, as everything else, it was interrupted during the pandemic. So we were able to resume our work on this project uh, last summer in 2022. Um, and our projection is to be done with everything we need to do, um, except for some minor tweaking, uh, by December of 2024. Um, that is our deadline. Uh, so this project was first developed um, by myself and Terry Wilfong, our then director of the Kelsey Museum, in collaboration with uh, Carrie Roberts and Suzanne Davis and Michelle Fontenot. Uh, Carrie and Suzanne are the conservators here, and Michelle is our collections manager. It's intended to be a resource for teaching and research. Uh, we want this to be a resource that reduces the barriers to access and engagement with the Kelsey Museum by digitally replicating um, the object handling program that we offer in person to university classes uh, at U of M. Um, so the idea is that if you can't physically come here or um, are not capable of participating in that activity, then we're trying to produce a um, resource that would allow you to engage with objects and the Kelsey Museum, either remotely or um, in a more uh, conducive format. Um, so what is DISCO? Um, so basically what this is going to, this resource will be is a website that is free and accessible to use. We are designing it so that there are no software requirements on the part of the user or any special equipment that will be needed to view our models. Um, we will be providing some basic information about the objects with the models, as well as some sample lesson plans for those who want to teach with them, just as a suggestion for how to use these, um, these particular models and, and the information we're providing. Um, in uh, 2022, we also added an additional element to this resource, which, is, which will be the ability to download a version of the 3D model to print if you have the if you have access to a 3D printer. That is the only one thing where you might need special equipment is if you wanted to print out these models. Um, but we hope that that will be a, a fun and useful resource as well. Um, we hope to also use these digital models ourselves to print out replicas of Kelsey objects uh, for future engagement activities. Um, we hope to also produce some replica objects that might be able to be sent to classrooms, schools, um, uh, community groups to continue engagement um, with the Kelsey Museum or in place of an in-person um, experience uh, when one is not possible. 
So that's sort of the basics of what this project is. Um, so how are we doing this? How are we making these models? So I'm going to turn this over to Taylor, who will talk a bit more about the technical side of the project. Awesome, thank you. Um, so on the next slide, um, we, so yeah, so the project um, first started out before I was here um, in 2019, um, and the primary method they were using is photogrammetry, um, which is very useful, uh, but it's very time consuming. It is using a, a, a camera to take multiple images of an object from all sides from different angles. Um, so you could imagine that takes a really long time um, to get the object all the way around. Um, you have a turntable and you want to take pictures at um, a bunch of different, we have a different, a bunch of different markers. You can't see it on um, in this picture, but um, that allows us to make sure we're capturing every inch of the object in a way that the photos will overlap with each other um, so we can build the models, which I'll talk about a little bit um, in a couple slides. Um, so photogrammetry was the way they were doing it when I first came. Um, it's very useful for really large ob objects for us still, um, but thankfully 3D technology has evolved quite a bit since the beginning of the project, just in the last couple years. Um, so if we move to the next slide, uh, I can talk a little bit about our methods um, for using LIDAR to create the models. Um, LIDAR stands for uh, light detection and ranging. Um, there are a couple different ways that we do this. Uh, you can uh, possibly do this if you have one of the newer uh, smartphones, both I think iPhones and I think Androids are either about to be able to do this or um, can already do this uh, if you have a, a, a nice enough camera on your phone. Um, but there are apps out there uh, that allow you to do this kind of uh, scanning with your phone. Um, for our methods, though, it's a little bit more helpful to have a uh, a heavy duty scanner. Um, so in this picture, obviously there's a lot going on, um, but there is a uh, scanner right in the center. It's on a little white tripod and it's kind of a, a little cylinder uh, looking thing. Um, it's very small, it's handheld. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and uh, that is attached to a turntable. Uh, which the object that we're scanning in this picture is on. Um, it's uh, we have we're scanning a Pixis in this uh, in this uh, image, and the turntable spins automatically. The scanner takes multiple scans of it uh, using a camera. Um, and then we have the, the, uh, the, a camera built into the scanner. And then we have a camera behind the scanner, which you can see on the left corner. Uh, and that is taking photos to stitch in the texture for the object. So the LiDAR scans the shape of the object and then the camera takes the pictures so that we get the really pretty detail that you see on the Pixis. Um, this works really well for medium to small objects, uh, but they can't be too small. Um, so on the next slide, uh, so with these different uh, different types of scanning uh, and creating models. There are different processes for making the models. Um, I have here sort of the like before and after of using photogrammetry. Um, so with photogrammetry, we have a bunch of different types. There are different options for software um, that we've kind of worked through, uh, but you are you put in all of your photos. It's usually between like 100 to 150 photos um, that you've taken of the object. And the software uses those points that overlap to create points uh, of the object. So on the picture on the left, you can kind of see that there are a bunch of little tiny dots. Um, and those are all points that are stitched together from the photos. And then it uses those points to create the 3D model, which you see on the left. Um, the scanner software is a little bit different uh, because we're taking actual scans and then stitching the scans together. So instead of having like points like that, um, they're actually scanned piece sections of the object. Um, usually, the software can stitch it together on its own, but sometimes I have to do that manually, um, which has been sort of a process of trial and error, which leads into the next slide um, that uh, as far as challenges, um, there have been a lot of days where it feels like 
everything is just kind of chaos uh, and I'm just at the middle trying to calm myself, <laughs> keep myself centered um, and that I'll figure it out. Um, but the, the cool thing about this project is that the 3D technology is constantly changing and getting better and getting more affordable. Um, which has allowed us to upgrade to a handheld scanner as opposed to using photography and photogrammetry, which takes a long time. Um, but the downside is with new technology, there's not as much help out there um, as there is on something like photogrammetry that has been around for much longer. It was kind of the original way to make 3D models. Um, and so there's been a lot of trial and error that has really just been me doing the trial and error, uh, not as many YouTube uh, tutorials as I would have liked um, or Reddit threads, um, but sometimes um, some objects don't scan well uh, and there are different ways to try to get them to scan. Um, but sometimes they're just too small or they're too dark. Um, the LiDAR technology uses light detection. Um, and so if the object has a lot of black on it, like some of our really beautiful pottery, it just doesn't pick up with the LiDAR, uh, which is really a shame because it, it is um, something we'd love to capture. But even with the photogrammetry, the software struggles a lot with darker textures. Um, the same thing with like reflective or translucent textures. So we can't do any glass, which is really a shame because we have some beautiful glass objects. Um, and then sometimes they're too flat or too symmetrical. Uh, like we have some really nice plates that uh, would be great, but the software just can't figure out where the plate begins and where it ends um, to align the scans and the photos. Um, so there are different things that I've done to make some of these objects work with the different softwares that I've used, um, but sometimes they just don't work, uh, which is kind of disappointing uh, because we really want to get as much of a variety of objects out as we can. But I think we've found a lot of solutions too along the way. And um, the process, like I said, is ever changing. And so that gives me some hope that uh, if I can't figure something out one day, the next month, I might be able to figure it out. So yeah. Thank you so much, Taylor. Um, so yeah, so then all of this work to create these models. Um, yeah, I think it's really, but just a, as a point to what Taylor was saying, it's, it, kind of cracked me up that um, the broken pieces of pottery are actually much easier to scan than say a, a whole beautiful vessel. <laughs> um, it seems kind of seems kind of funny to me. But anyway, um, so what are our next steps with this now that we have we created um, most of our models and Taylor will continue to create some models um, through next year. Um, just until we finish getting, we, we're hoping, we're shooting for between 120 and 150 Kelsey objects to be captured in this way. Um, our next steps will be to create the, to populate the website that is being developed for us. Um, we have hired Boxcar Studios to develop the website and our Kelsey Museum graphic designer, Eric Campbell is actually doing the design and he gave me permission to share with you a preview of what that will look like. So here on the screen, you can see what we, what we plan the landing page to look like when you link uh, to this project. Um, it will open to this initial page where you should be able to select and sort objects based on function, material, uh, region where they come from or um, a selected theme. So things like burial or uh, cooking or daily life, those sorts of uh, general topics. Um, you can click on one of those and it will bring you to a similar looking page where you will see all of the objects that have been captured um, for you to view um, sorted in this way. So to help people not have to sort through um, 150 objects themselves, but to, to help guide the experience a bit. And from there, you can select an object to view. And the plan is to have that, that initial view look something like this. So you can see here, we have our little Roman period Bess. Well, not so little, he's actually quite large. Um, right here, we have I've got this close-up picture of him. And on this landing page, you will see um, information about him. So we plan to import things like the date, the you know where where he was found, um, maybe the cultural context and a brief description, um, all of which are coming from our database uh, here at the Kelsey. And then um, you will also hear where you may see some related links, which the many little Besses here represent objects that we we would connect with this saying, oh, if you liked Bess, you may also like this one here. Um, there will be a link to be able to download the model of 
best if you have a 3D printer. Um, and then also the link to connect to the page um, where you can actually manipulate the 3D model um, in, uh, in space. So here is the, um, the actual viewing page, how we've planned it out. You'll be able to turn the figure, zoom in, zoom out, flip it over, look at it from all different sides. Um, the viewer controls are here at just basic keyboard keys or uh, keyboard strokes or um, using the mouse will help you rotate. Um, and we'll have a little bit uh, a continuation of information just so that as you're looking at it, you can reference back, oh, this is dated to the Roman period coming from Egypt. Um, so hopefully people will enjoy exploring these objects and be able to use them for teaching and research. Uh, we plan to have this website ready for public viewing uh, this coming spring, um, although we will continue to add more models as they are finished um, throughout 2024. Um, by fall of 2024, we hope that um, we will also be uh, soliciting feedback from users uh, through surveys and focus groups to help fine tune this interface um, and any tweaking that needs to happen um, as far as user uh, experience um, should be completed early in 2025. So that is our plan for moving forward with this. Um, and that is my 15 minutes, but I did want to say that um, we are so excited to be able to offer this resource to our visitors and our audiences. And um, I hope to hear from you, um, thoughts you have about this, any questions you may have. Um, but I do wanna take this opportunity to thank everyone who has participated in this project and assisted us along the way. This includes the Kelsey staff that I've already mentioned, as well as uh, Scott Meyer, our exhibition designer. Um, um, all of the students who have worked on this project. Oh, all of our curators, I have to say, Janet and Elaine and Nicola and Terry um, have all at some point or other reviewed information and helped guide us in picking out objects and things like that and thank them very much for that. Um, also the, the staff at LS and ATS who helped us sort through the equipment that we would need to do this and Adam Roundtree at the uh, UMORPH project who helped advise the development of this project as well. And of course the people um, at Boxcar Studios who are making it accessible now. So I will turn it over to everyone for questions. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Kathy and Taylor. Um, and I just want to, at this point, open up the floor to our audience for questions. Um, feel free to put your question in the chat and I will read it out. Or if you want to unmute yourself, um, unmute yourself and ask your question, um, feel free to do that. I think Elaine has a question. You're muted, Elaine. Sorry. <laughs> um, I was clicking on the wrong microphone. Um, well, that was great. Thank you so much. And it's such a, an exciting project. I'm delighted to know how far it's come. Um, and I, I just have a a uh, question about uh, the use of DISCO in research projects because um, mm -hmm. and, and publication, you know, what the ultimate um, goal would be uh, once the, the project has not only reached its first stage, but presumably will continue. Um, and I, I'm thinking of it selfishly because I'm still working on sculpture at the Kelsey and um, many pieces of which are small fragments as you know, mm -hmm. um, and I think it'd be just great to be able to um, publish those, you know, in 3D and- mm -hmm. uh, I certainly don't. Um, we are trying to produce model. Well, so in capturing um, this information, uh, the, the images, we're doing it um, in high resolution and then reducing the resolution to make it accessible on the website. But those initial models and those initial um, files exist. So if there needed to be, um, a high res model to for publication worthy um, imaging that certainly would be accessible uh, from the project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that would probably involve all, um, Michelle again, thinking about the rights and reproduction side of it, but certainly um, 
we encourage people to use this for research and, and publication. Absolutely, it's the idea is to make the Kelsey's um, collection more accessible. Um, however, people want to access us. I also see this as an opportunity uh, for researchers to maybe preview something in 3D before mm -hmm. deciding whether to, they needed to come to the Kelsey and see it in person um, to get a better sense of what our collections are. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers that question. <laughs> it does, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question um, in the chat from uh, Patricia. Mm -hmm. um, will all the objects be from those on display? So it is a selection of things from storage that aren't normally on display, as well as a few things on display. Um, one of the challenges with the stuff on display is getting access to it um, and then getting it back on display. Um, so we wanted to be mindful not to um, not to use up all of um, our staff's time in accessing the things that are on display, but certainly to to try and replicate some of the experience that people might have if they can't come to the museum, some of the things they might see on display. Um, I would say actually quite a, a larger portion of it is coming from things that were in our, in our storage area um, that students would handle if they would came for an object handling experience. Um, and a few things that actually, um, I've not used project handling in the past, but might now because I found them in this project and they're really cool. <laughs> so, yeah. Any other questions? This is probably off the wall, but is there a possibility to um, use the imagery for uh, students like the ones that participate in the Kelsey Prize for creative reasons um, in the animation or pixelation? I'd like to see this fellow fighting. <laughs> I love that idea. And actually, that was something that Terry and I talked about early on was um, when we we're thinking about access and whether or not we wanted to put some kind of um, barrier in place that people might be able, to, artists might be able to download or 3D print and do their own interpretation of what best should best have a hot pink skirt on. Like, <laughs> let's explore that possibility or, you know, some other way. Um, of engaging with with our, our materials, absolutely. Anyone else? Oh. I think there's we a question a... in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, from Doug White. Um, and then we'll... Terry has a question too. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, so I'll read out Doug's question first. Um, will the three D models all be? on one part of the Kelsey website, or will some be scattered throughout for viewing? So right now, all of this resource will live on a single website that is um, for this. For this, It will be connected through the, the main website for the Kelsey so that you'll be able to find this um, probably through a couple of different links um, where it's relevant. So maybe through the collections maybe. as well as education, that kind of thing. Um, but the, it'll all live on one sort of one website. Um, especially because the way we are storing the material so that you can access the files, it has to be, it, it, it's a lot. It's a very big um, storage problem. So not problem, but um, a lot of data that needs to be saved somewhere and easily accessed. So we were trying to keep it all in one place, but yeah, you should be able to access it fairly easily through the Kelsey website. Yeah. Terry. Um, it's fantastic to see this. Thanks so much for this talk. Mm -hmm. I remember when we first started talking about this and just I had no idea that we would get this far. And <laughs> Do you see any any kind of applications for this moving ahead for other kinds of uses? And I'm thinking particularly of our fieldwork projects, uh, whether this kind of technology might be something that we could do. Oh, certainly. And actually, that's something I've been talking with Nick about. Uh, actually, he's the one who suggested we try the iPad LiDAR scanning because he wanted to use it at Gabi. Um, so that's why we first decided to move away from, well, not move away, but explore possibilities outside of photogrammetry. Um, when we started the project and I was doing the initial research for how to do this, um, photogrammetry was 
the best out there. And now the technology for LIDAR scanning has come so far in the last um, four years that um, we now can look at those options. But absolutely, I think. Um, and in fact, I think, you know, this might be a great way to, yeah, explore that for sure. Yeah. It's fantastic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, I guess if there are no other questions, we might wrap up soon. Um, so last call maybe <laughs> in case any questions pop up. Okay, well, I think we'll wrap up. Um, I just want to say thank you so much to Kathy and Taylor. Um, this was an incredibly interesting um, talk, and I'm excited to see where this project goes in the future. Thank you, everyone who has joined today, um, and we uh, check our website for future flash talks. Thank you so much. <laughs>